Salutations, gentle viewers. This is George from Ireland. I'm on King Street in St. James's, London. Behind me, you can see the house in which Napoleon III resided in 1848. So who was Napoleon III? Well, he was the nephew of Napoleon I. Napoleon the Great, people sometimes call him, to distinguish him from his not-so-great nephew. So uh, Napoleon III, he was born in the Netherlands. His father was King Louis of Holland one of the younger brothers of Napoleon Bonaparte. So Napoleon Bonaparte had himself made Emperor of France through a fraudulent referendum and uh, was a parvenu, as aristocrats and royalty called him. Uh, they looked down their aquiline noses at Napoleon, who had a chip in his shoulder about coming from a merely bourgeois family and therefore had his uh, sisters and brothers placed, it, placed on the thrones of Europe but they was no, it was not accepted by the established crown heads as being a real king. So he made his brother, Louis, King of Holland, and that's why um, his brother Louis addressed the uh, Dutch Parliament. And um, being a Frenchman, really a Corsican, uh, he spoke uh, the Dutch language very badly. And he wished to announce to the Dutch, I am the King of Holland. But he mispronounced it and said with great flourish, I am the Rabbit of Holland. Uh, which was not the effect he'd been hoping for. However, the people of the Netherlands took him to their hearts. He had at least attempted to uh, learn their notoriously tricky tongue. We don't say double Dutch for nothing. So, um, uh, Napoleon III, many people speculate that his father was not his mother's husband because uh, Louis of the Netherlands uh, was well known to be homosexual. Um, two sons had been previously born, also named Napoleon, both died in infancy. Anyway, this Napoleon III, when he was a little boy, his uncle was overthrown, and therefore his father was overthrown. The Orange family came back to the Netherlands, no longer Stadtholders as actually king. So um, Louis, the Napole Louis Napoleon grew up uh, largely in, in Switzerland. He met so many Italian nationalists, he embraced the cause of nationalism, and he thought the 19th century was the century of nationalism, so he must put himself at the head of that column as he saw it. And um, he uh, largely mythologized his uncle's memory and he wrote The Principles of Bonapartism, which is an oxymoron since uh, Bonaparte had no principles, had been a Jacobin, the most radical sort of Republican, uh, then to being um, an imperialist with his, himself as emperor, you know, who was considered converting to Islam or founding his own religion or working for the Shah of Iran and always changing sides. So he was an archivist, plain and simple. Um, and eventually met as Waterloo, as we know. So Napoleon III, he made a couple of failed attempts at comebacks in France, but was quickly defeated um, and was in prison for several years. He uh, had a romantic liaison with his washerwoman, who became great with his child. He didn't wed her because he wanted to save himself for a woman of the blood royal. So 1848, there's another French Revolution, and um, Louis-Philippe was overthrown. France briefly became a republic. Uh, so he, uh, Louis, Louis Napoleon, as he was called, or Napoleon III, he stood for election as president, and indeed he was elected. Uh, the realistic choice is between him and General Cavagnac, the, the, the butcher of June. Ma sacré tu, <coughs> as he'd said. My sacred cough, which is uh, also a homophone for massacre all. And that's why Cavagnac's troops um, shot down hundreds of protesters in the streets of Paris. So he wasn't going to be president, so Louis Napoleon Bonaparte became president. Um, but three years later, there was the 18th Brumaire, when um, he had his coup d'etat, really redolent of his uncle's coup d'etat about 50 years earlier. And that's why um, Karl Marx quoted, I think it was um, the German historian Hegel, the history repeats itself, first time as tragedy, second time as farce. Uh, because he was always trying to live up to the legend of his uh, most estimable uncle, who was a military genius and an expert in several fields. Whatever you make of his amorality, uh, he was certainly clever. But all right, let, let, let's give him his due. Uh, Louis Napoleon achieved a lot. He revived a monarchy many people thought was completely extinct. And so he had himself declared emperor, and France became fairly mighty, began its colonial expansion, um, annexed um, Indochina mostly what we now call uh, um, Vietnam, things like that. And industry developed, had Haussmann rebuild much of Paris, tried to reduce poverty. What else, he, he penned a few books as well. The Extinction of Pauperism, 
as though he was mainly actuated by sympathy for the penniless. Um, and uh, he wasn't actually a socialist, but he thought they had to give a nod in that direction. So he married Eugenie, a, um, a woman of a Spanish noble family, and they had one son uh, who did not live very long, Prince Imperial. He came to grief in Zululand after his father. But anyway, um, so it was always going fairly well, some minor victories helping in the cause of Italian nationalism, fighting against Austria. Um, but he came to grief um, because of Bastille Day 1870, when uh, there was the AMM's telegram, which uh, the uh, uh, King of Prussia was sending to him, and um, uh, Bismarck edited it to try and make it seem as uh, contemptuous as possible. And this provoked Louis Napoleon, who was feeling in a hyper-nationalistic move, who rashly declared war on Prussia, and all the German states took the side of Prussia. Up until that time, France could count on perhaps a couple of the big pro-French, particularly Bavaria, several of the big neutral, but oh no, they all declared war on, on Germany, and that was the Franco-Prussian War, which the, um, the French lost, the Battle of Sedan, very close to the, to the Belgian frontier, and um, what's his name, Napoleon III, was captured. The Treaty of Frankfurt, having to pay a huge indemnity of gold francs, uh, his monarchy was over, and he was in prison for a while. Um, the, the French were then slaughtering each other, the Paris Commune, but Napoleon III, he was a prisoner by that time, released, and he came to the United Kingdom. He didn't live in this house at the end of his life, but he died here in the UK in 1873, very shortly after being released from prison by the Germans, and his son, um, Louis Napoleon, was here. Sorry, Prince Imperial, as he's known, was here. His only begotten child. Well, within wedlock, he had some born outside of marriage. And his son went to, um, with the British Army to Zululand in 1879, and um, for, under Viscount Thesica's command, but um, sorry, Viscount Chelmsford's command, formerly the Honourable Thesica, and his uh, son was killed at a um, skirmish uh, against the Zulus. So that didn't quite wipe out the Bonaparte dynasty because he had other brothers and sisters and their relatives, so some of them could claim it. He's called Napoleon III because after um, his uncle died, the eldest surviving member of the family, the head of the household was really Joseph, um, Napoleon Bonaparte's eldest brother, who'd been the putative king of Spain for a while, who had any daughters. Well, that's why this Napoleon is Napoleon III. And he's buried here in the United Kingdom. His son, Prince Imperial, is buried in Sandhurst, the Royal Military Academy. So that is uh, the bizarre historical phenomenon of Louis Napoleon. Uh, for a while, was uh, reasonably well regarded, fairly popular, and um, taken seriously on the diplomatic stage. So it's by no means inevitable that France would have returned to, to a republic. And indeed, Adolf Thiers said they chose a republic because it was a system that divided the least. They were to have a royal family. Which one? There were three of them. The legitimists wanted the Bourbon family. Others want the Orleanists, the descendants of uh, Louis-Philippe Egalité. He'd changed his surname to Equality, the time of the French Revolution. Or indeed, uh, the Bonapartists. So that is Napoleon III.